Uh, hi everyone, thank you so much for coming down. My name is Ankit Sopti and I'm one of the co-founders and the CTO here at Postman. And I'm really, really excited to be here. I know there are a lot of choices for your time today, but thank you so much for coming down and listening to me talk about something that uh, has been sort of part of a personal journey of mine this year, which is building a scalable microservices architecture. So as part of this talk, I will talk about this whole idea of dependencies in microservices architecture how you inevitably reach a situation which is commonly known as dependency hell in microservices by either not following the right processes or having certain uh, steps that need to be taken for uh, care of. And I'll talk about one pattern called as consumer-driven contracts, which helps you mitigate a part of this quagmire of dependency hell. Uh, a little something about myself. So I've been with Postman since the very beginning. I was wrote one of the first few lines of the application when it came out in 2012. And I've been associated with that since then. And of course, I'm really passionate about APIs. So Postman has come a long way since its uh, API testing origins. Now, API is used by millions of developers around in hundreds of thousands of organizations around the world uh, to manage every aspect of the API development workflow, starting from a case that you, most of you would be familiar with, which is debugging APIs, going all the way from designing, documenting, monitoring your APIs, automated testing, and publishing. Right? This is a talk not about Postman so much, so I will not spend too much time on this slide, but we'll talk more about consumer-driven contracts. Right. So uh, we founded the company in late 2014, about four years ago, and we already had a really popular product, Postman. We had about 650,000 users at the time in almost every single country in the world, and uh, we had a four-member engineering team. And microservices at the time were really, really popular. Like everybody was talking about it, and we also, as part of starting to build out our backend system, started breaking our backend systems down. And as engineers who loved abstractions and forward thinking architectures, the benefits of microservices just made a lot of sense. The benefits of creating small, strong modular boundaries the ability to independently deploy systems. And as a CTO, I could imagine this large teams of developers working within the organization, building things independently, deploying them, and you know, this beautifully scalable architecture that would work really, really well, even organizationally. And of course, uh, the idea of technological diversity, or of po what is called as uh, polyglot technologies, which basically that I could choose the right tool to solve a particular problem that I intended to. Uh, I could use Erlang to build a high availability system. I could use Node.js to build a real-time uh, high-frequency app. And what we really didn't know or understand at the time were the costs of building these microservices architecture, because we had no experience building it before this. And this was the first time that we embarked looking at the upper half of this slide, and it may just made sense. Right? And if you talk about the costs of building distributed systems that are eventually consistent and require a really mature operations team to roll them out, uh, this problem compounds really quickly, really. Yeah. Uh, so distributed computing has a few fallacies. So this comes from a paper that was published in 1996. And it talks about all of these assumptions that distributed systems assume to be true. However, Murphy's Law, which is what can fail, will fail, and uh, none of these things in production systems turn out to be true. And this is something that constantly affects this idea of uh, building distributed systems. Right. So uh, talking a little bit about dependency hell. So this dependency hell comes from this software package world, think NPM, in which I have a module that is dependent on another module that is dependent on another module, and so on, and so on, and so on. And then you face issues in production where you realize that the system is not working anymore because uh, there is a circular dependency across 100 different nodes that are finally connected together. And these things are really hard to debug. And uh, security is another aspect. If you have a, one of these sub-dependencies 100 levels down into the system, which has a security vulnerability, and you don't even know you're directly dependent on it, extended that to this whole idea of distributed architectures, and you fall into a trap of what is called as a dependency hell of microservices. Which, and common symptoms, and this is something that we started seeing as well earlier this year, was around uh, an architecture in which you have a system where one service fails, all of them fail. All these services need to be deployed together because I have tested all of them together in this beta or pre-staging environment. And hey, they work really well. How do I take them to production? Oh, I cannot take one of these things to production because the entire thang thing has to go up. And of course, and this one is a big problem, that services cannot evolve independently because they either share their databases, which means that now you have no clear abstraction between uh, different services consuming the same source of data and how they are consuming it. Uh, 
and also because there are leaky abstractions that move across services. And I might have an updated ad field exposed through one of my APIs that somebody else is consuming it, and I have no real way of knowing whether services, uh, whether I'm going to break somebody else's contract. So fundamentally, what you end up with is a system that is more commonly referred to as a distributed monolith, which is a monolithic architecture with all the cost of monolithic architectures combined with all the cost of building distributed systems. And this is messy, right? So why does this happen? So if you look at a simple microservices architecture, I think there are nine odd services that exist here, right? What you have fundamentally done is built a system in which these nodes become easier to develop, but making a system that composes them and reliably works becomes hard. And fundamentally, your entire focus shifts from building the nodes uh, to building the interconnection between the nodes. And it's really hard at times to A, evolve these services independently without possibly breaking another by knowing what exactly is changing, and also knowing uh, in, in sometimes which services are communicating with each other at all. And uh, there are certain abstractions that need to be created in place to actually build a system that can work this way. In a traditional monolithic world, you had a certain degree of confidence that I had before releasing a system to production, and that's what we used to do earlier. You have unit tests which are testing for your business logic. You have integration tests that are checking for how different components integrate with each other. And finally, you have this end-to-end -end environment that you set up. You, in some cases, have QA teams and dev teams doing both manual testing and automated testing on these systems and getting all of these systems to work reliably together. But hey, at the end of this, I could say that the system works and now I can go to production and I have a certain degree of reliability to be accomplish that. In a microservices world, I lose the top two because Unit test, test from a business logic, so I can test my independent service working correctly just fine, and that works really well. But using integration tests in a microservices world is hard, and it's also expensive. And it takes a lot of time for these integration tests to run. And in a, micro, in a monolithic world, where I am, let's say, deploying my systems very infrequently because it's an expensive exercise to do that, I would probably do this entire suite once a month if I'm really, really agile in that system. or uh, or, but in this system, where you're promoting this entire architecture in which I can do multiple releases uh, uh, on, a, in a, on a daily basis, this becomes really hard. So, and doing integration tests, if it takes 20 minutes to run an integration test, that's too slow because I don't know how much time do I need to wait for this. There are systems like containerization and Docker which help improve and soothe the pain of building these systems, but there's only so much you can scale with them. End-to-end -end tests pretty much break this whole idea of microservices because now you are again saying that I'm setting up this whole environment in which these components work together, but they only work together because they rely on these particular versions of the dependencies and I have to take this entire system up, which means that I cannot deploy independently. So fundamentally, as a developer, how can I confidently deploy a new version of my service? And these things can get messy real fast. And this is, an, this is a diagram from Amazon, this is 2009. I really don't know what this looks like now, or why they chose this color combination. Uh, this is Netflix much more recently, I think four or five years ago. These are traditionally known as Death Star diagrams, evolving from the Star Wars world. The idea, I mean, the analogy being that uh, you have this extremely expensively uh, piece of you know, uh, system that has been built out to conquer the world, yet there is this one point at which I can strategically strike and bring down the entire ecosystem. And that's effectively what you have when you have a distributed monolith, right? So the question really uh, transforms into, how do I solve for this idea of dependencies within my system? Uh, this has been one of my favorite books on the topic of building microservices from Sam Newman. And he talks about this principles of microservices design. And pretty much, I would say this is the Bible and all the things that we do in terms of building a sustainable microservices architecture fall somewhere in one of these uh, seven principles. So today, we're going to talk about uh, deploying independently. Let's drill down a little bit more into this whole provider-consumer system by looking at a single node. So the way that we work right now is that your provider creates a contract to any consumer who wants to use this API. This can be of many forms. It can be an open API specifications. It can be a Postman collection. I have seen people use Google Docs and Excel spreadsheets, so whatever works. But, uh, but this is how you are defining a contract from the produce, provider of the API to the consumer of the API. And it says that, hey, this is how you can use my API. But then it becomes the responsibility of the provider to ensure that any changes to the service do not break the contract that they have provided. 
And in production, it's really hard because you might have some leaky abstraction that might have just gone out. This updated ad column, I never wanted to go out, but it's there. And if somebody starts using it, I was never, it was never even part of the declared contract, but it, it is there in production. And how do we even know there's a breaking change? And from a consumer's perspective, it's really, really hard to manage this in a production system because my system suddenly stops working and I don't know if something I did or it's something that uh, downstream went wrong. And uh, how do I collaboratively now rely on systems uh, for uh, my functioning? One of the more naive strategies here can be I can just create a new API version per release. But how sustainable does that really be? You, for, every cons for every provider version from going from v1 to v1.1 to v1.1.1, and if you're doing 20 releases a day, the system, of course, stops scaling down. And that's where one of these strategies comes in, this idea of consumer-driven contracts, which basically, what it does is that now you shift this paradigm of the provider writing the integration tests in the existing system to now shifting some of the responsibility over to the consumer. So effectively what you're doing is that you are encouraging your consumers to write your integration tests. Uh, uh, and uh, so API consumer write context, uh, contracts to test this API. It's basically like a declaration of, hey, this is how I'm using this API. And the consumer only tests the endpoints and properties that it needs. Uh, this contract can be shared with the, with the provider, both at the time of the API design process or it can be after the API has already been designed. Both strategies are okay. If you are providing that in the first case, you are basically now also indicating to the provider that, hey, this is how I'm using your, how I intend to use your API, so your API design can account for all of my use cases. And it's actually a very good way of building systems. Uh, so what, when you have multiple consumers for your API, what you fundamentally have is a pattern for these evolving services where independent services can now evolve independently. Each consumer captures their own expectation of this provider in a separate contract. And these contracts are now shared with the provider so they can also gain insight into the obligations that they must satisfy for the consumer and also know that, hey, this is how they're intending to use the API, and it makes sense. But it's extremely important in this consumer-first world for these contracts to be explicit and executable because now I can run in my own setup this contract that has been provided to me and know for a fact that I am not breaking somebody else's usage of the API. Um, you can execute this expectation until, uh, against multiple consumers and you know exactly which consumer you have broken. And it makes a lot of sense to actually integrate that as part of your continuous deployment workflow. Uh, so the way that we do it is that we stop any release if the, if the contract is broken once you, uh, in your continuous deployment setup. And of course, the most important thing here is that it is now allowing independent isolated testing of the service before going to production. Now, you're not doing end-to-end -end tests, which are really expensive to do. And in the pyramid that I showed earlier of the testing strategies, uh, the lower you are in that spectrum, the more isolated you are in your testing system, and the more independently you can evolve without breaking people who are relying on you. But it's, while we're talking about this, it's extremely important to also look at what a contract test is not. It is not a test of business logic. It is something that needs to be covered by your unit tests. And if a consuming service cares about how the data is being generated, not the way that is represented through the API, that basically means the problem is somewhere else. The problem is where your business boundaries itself are not properly defined. It is not a service license agreement between these services. It does not state for how long a service should be available or how many requests per minute it can handle. And it also doesn't work as a system to validate external API service responses. If you're relying on Google Maps API and the Google Maps API were to change, that is, cannot be covered in this thing. So it's mostly a system for APIs that you can control in which the provider has certain control over the consumer. So while we were thinking about adopting this whole idea of consumer-driven contract and uh, looking at a tooling system that can help us automate this, because the idea of consumer-driven contracts has been around since 2006. It was published first on uh, Martin Fowler's blog uh, from ThoughtWorks. And, it, and uh, while we are looking at this tooling, what we wanted to do was create all of these systems, something that I can use to consistently uh, describe requests and responses between provider and consumer easily create contracts, easily store these contracts, a way of testing these services against the contract in an automated way. The manual way is to look at the specification and the consumption, but the automated way is to make sure that you're not breaking somebody else's system. And of course, have a way to run these tests locally and manage the evolution of these contracts over time. Funnily enough, we realized that Postman actually does that really well. 
and uh, all of the systems that we were using internally uh, evolved really well. So I have two recommendations of systems here. Uh, the first one is from uh, the PACT Foundation. PACT Foundation is the definitive uh, system that you can use to manage and build your API contracts. Postman also does all of these things and uh, I think it's mostly a matter of choice. We like all of these uh, API level abstractions to stay closer to the APIs rather than closer to the code. So PACT works really well and I highly recommend checking it out when you want to keep all of these abstractions closer to the code. And when you want to keep these closer to your APIs, that's where Postman comes in. So in a system like this, uh, I'll focus on some of the strategies that we use at Postman to in uh, integrate uh, consumer-driven contracts and how we manage to stay agile and also do concurrent development across multiple microservices so you can actually have your independent deployments and independent workflows. Uh, so of course we use Postman because dog food, right? So uh, I'll quickly touch upon some of the things that we do. So a Postman collection uh, is an executable specification of an API. It, is, it allows you to define the API, but it also allows it to execute. And it is collaboratively available to anybody who's within your team to actually look at it, consume it, and uh, edit it. And uh, these collections can be executed locally within the app, the Postman app. Uh, it can be executed in the command line or in CI systems. It can also be executed within the cloud. And I'll talk about each of these things in a bit. So the first thing that we do is we have this, I don't think it's a commonly known uh, idea, but we use this idea called as blueprint collections. So when you define your API specification, what it really does, it's like a, I think of it like a reference manual that, hey, this is, this is what covers this API definition. But along with this API specification, which can be an open API file, it can be a RAML file, it can be a Postman collection, doesn't really matter, right? Along with that, we have this idea of, uh, uh, the Blueprint Collection, which is uh, created by the service uh, provider, and it's not just a declaration of how you can use my API, it's a direct declaration of how you should use my API. Because we spoke about this idea that consumer contracts are shared during the API design process, so your uh, developers are now aware of how these APIs are going to be consumed, and it provides recommendations that, hey, these are the different functionality, and runs through certain scenarios or implementation of, hey, this is how you can be using my API. Uh, to which you can add examples, uh, which is uh, basically just saved responses in multiple different contexts, which are shared with, uh, with your team, uh, which is consumable through HTML documentation uh, to everyone within the team. And we have this idea of run and post and button, which makes your consumers instantly actionable to, on, uh, to the API. Because now I'm not thinking about going through a reference manual. I'm actually now able to run through some of these examples and start using them. And also from that blueprint collection, you get this idea of mocking your APIs, which is useful for consumers to start building their contracts and services even before the service is set up. And finally, we have the consumer contracts that are written by the consumers, which are fundamentally nothing but these collections with tests and requests uh, within them. And it is based on the blueprint collection. Uh, sometimes you also experiment with this idea of these throwaway contracts where the consumer of the API writes their own contract and say, hey, this is how I'm using the API. I can expose this as a mock of the API. You can use this as a reference manual while you are building your API, but I'm going to use this to build my system and I'm going to throw it away later And once uh, because we want the API provider to control the API definition. Uh, so uh, it provides an input, and finally, they write these contracts on top of these API definitions, uh, which can be executed both as part of the contract workflow of the consumer and of the provider. Uh, quickly summarizing the different stages, the producer publishes the blueprint of the API. The consumer uses the blueprint to build contracts. Some of these contracts can also be built in the development uh, phase. Consumer tests these endpoints or the properties that they use, which is their understanding of that API. And finally, the, the producers, the providers of the API continuously test these contracts before deploying any new system. Uh, you can, of course, run them locally. You can run them in CI. You can also run them in production. And this basically serves as an indicator, which you can set this as a cadence of a minute or an hour or whatever you want to, and basically serves as an indicator that, hey, my system stopped working. I don't know how yet, but if I have a contract continuously running on all of my depend dependent systems, I know that, hey, something changed and somebody broke my contract, and this is why my system is not working right now. And it's a very, very clear indicator, an important indicator to know. Uh, and quickly to summarize, sometimes you do have to break these contracts. And at that point, you have to introduce this idea of versioning within your APIs. Now, there are two commonly known strategies for API versioning. Uh, 
Uh, one strategy is this idea of creating multiple different API versions, where uh, every consumer can uh, now talk to a different, entirely different API version. The recommendation that I usually give is that you should not have more than three concurrent versions of the API, because at any point, if you have to, let's say, do a security patch, if it's a single package update, which is of one of your dependencies, it's fine, it's a pain, but you still have to do it. But if it's a logical flaw, and you now you have to go back to this piece of code that you probably wrote or somebody else wrote like a year ago, it becomes really messy. So the, one of the strategies is also to write these coexisting endpoints, where these endpoints can coexist with your code base, which are newer endpoints, and break the functionality. And over time, your consumers can start using these endpoints. And it's important to maintain a balance between these two things. But all of these API versions need to be clearly communicated to the consumers. So quickly summarizing, it allows uh, consumer-driven contracts allow developers to deploy services independently and confidently without the need for having expensive end-to-end -end tests. They tie the service evolution to actual business value because the providers are getting the consumer's input into how they want to consume the API at the very beginning of the process. And it, it allows them to clearly align the business goals with the consumers. But keeping in mind that they are only applicable to a system where the uh, pr uh, producers can exert some control how the consumers will be establishing contracts with them. It just doesn't work with external APIs. And they're not a cure-all for the dependency problem. There are multiple different strategies under that framework that I showed you earlier. But they do provide insights into what constitutes a breaking change. Thank you. So, anybody? Or everything was so clear. <laughs> okay, I'll be around at uh, tomorrow as well at the postman counter. So please feel free to ask any questions if you have. Yeah. Nobody. Right. Okay. Thanks. Right, thanks thank you. Great.